As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a first-time guest tonight. Jeff Clark, a senior precious metals analyst from goldsilver.com, is with us here on Reluctant Preppers. He's going to talk to us about a recent article he wrote called Why I'm Not Worried About Where Gold is Headed. Jeff, thanks for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. I'm glad to be here, anxious to talk to your audience. Since this is your first time here with us, could you give us a quick uh, understanding of where you came from and how you got into this business? Uh, It's actually an interesting story. My family uh, does own some mining claims, mostly gold and silver in uh, California, Nevada, Arizona. And my dad, when he moved to California, became very interested in this. And uh, so he started buying up mining claims, <laughs> and uh, this was probably 20 years ago, and started working them. And he's, you know, he's found some various things in that. And I, I always enjoyed it, but you know, panning, and you know, we're talking about placer mining, right? So it's 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 the small stuff. It's not mechanized mining. So, uh, it, you know, placer mining is you know taking a pan out there in the river and you know that sort of thing. And your dad's a prospector. My dad is a prospector, and wow. he looks he looks like one, and he uh, he could be a he could be a uh, in a movie, you know, as a extra for uh, these old <laughs> westerns or something. He looks the part, you know, and he's getting up in years now, so it's harder for him to get out. And so some of the he's let some of the claims go, but I always enjoyed, you know, getting outdoors and of course finding gold. But it's kind of like fishing, you know, you never know what you're going to find when you go out there. You could you could spend all day and find nothing, or you could find something in the first ten minutes. So you you never know what you're going to find, but. So I've been to a lot of these claims out in the middle of nowhere all over the place. And uh, you know, the, the largest thing he ever found was like a three and a half ounce nugget. Holy uh, moly. Yeah, it was it was part of a cluster of uh you know, uh, other ore that was kind of mixed in there, you know, but it's really pretty and there's about three and a half ounces in there. That's the biggest find he ever had. And we once had something we tried to sell, a claim we tried to sell, but the the last minute they backed out, but but at any rate, I've I've been exposed to it. My dad's uh, been a big part of it. He's even won some gold panning contests and things like that. The, yes, they do have those kind of things. And <laughs> he's got the technique. <laughs> he's got the technique down. Yeah, he's he's definitely not you know uh, the best in the world or anything like that. There's some guys that are really really good at it. But uh, so how did you get from being the son of a, a prospector to being a senior precious metals analyst at GoldSilver.com? Well, I don't know if anybody you know knows my name or not, but I used to work at Casey Research, and I've always been a good writer. So uh, I combined my love of writing with my love of gold, <laughs> and uh, uh, I got hired at Casey Research by submitting some writing samples and things like that, and went through a compliance process with them and and uh, they liked what they saw I started out on a probationary basis and ended up working with Louis James who runs International Speculator at, at Casey Research and so he and I were partners in crime I guess you could say for many years there and so uh, writing a, a newsletter then I went to the Hard Assets Alliance temporarily after there were some uh, ownership changes at Casey Research and uh, stayed there for a little while, and then I moved over to goldsilver.com, and that's where I've been ever since, just writing strictly about gold and silver. Well, your recent article entitled Why I'm Not Worried About Where Gold is Headed was eye-catching, and, and as part of your writing skill, obviously writing titles is part of that, uh, so it was a very good good title. And uh, it drew us in because we have a lot of guests on our channel. Uh, a lot of our audience are keenly interested in uh, lowering systemic risk uh, that they can't control uh, from the the uh, in the economy and in the monetary system and in the debt-based banking system, uh, lowering that risk to their family by not participating 
uh, in as as most consumers are are apt to in in the riskier portions of our economy, but instead finding ways to protect their families. So a lot of them are keenly interested in the direction and the, um, the how this is going to play out and um, making sure that they're on the right side of history as things uh, unfold literally. So your article about why you're not worried about where gold is headed, and, and it was kind of interesting because in our correspondence by email around that, you clarified uh, that it wasn't that you don't care where gold is headed, it's that you're not worried about it. So that's, could you that's uh, exactly make, right. make that distinction for us, and why is that important? Well, it's an interesting story. I was on a plane, and I was in business class, and I sat down next to a gentleman who was in a tie, obviously you know, a, a corporate type of guy, and we struck up a conversation. It led to, what do you do for a living? And I told him. And he said, so you own gold? And he got this puzzled look on his face, like, why would you own gold, you know? And I said, yes, uh, I do. And of course, I don't tell a lot of people I, I have gold. When you're in a public eye, you have to be careful about that sort of thing. But he, he looked at me and says, well, OK, well, why gold? And I could tell by the look on his face that he genuinely wanted to know. He wasn't challenging okay. me. He wasn't mocking me. He, he genuinely wanted to know, why, why, why do you own gold? And uh, this was earlier this year. So gold had been going up um, you know, quite a bit. We all know it's been up a lot year to date, but he still couldn't – he couldn't understand why someone would buy physical gold. <laughs> why would you buy mm -hmm. gold, physical gold and silver? You know? Sure. And I realized that – I had, I had a you know one paragraph pitch I needed to make to this person, uh, to explain to him why I own gold. What what was the core reason that someone who knows nothing about gold, and genuinely wants to know why I own it? What is the one thing that I could tell them that would help them to understand not only why I own gold, but maybe why they should consider it for part of their portfolio, and this is what this this article was the outcrop of that uh, thinking of mine in, in the in the few seconds I put together in my head why I wanted to tell him I, why I owned gold, and you know the real thing for me is not just the reasons I own gold, but you know the title of that really is true. I'm not worried about where it's where it's headed. I I, I really am not. And that's because if you go through the list of reasons, which uh, let's face it, the, the, the reasons that we all own gold all center around one thing, and it's what our government has done to our monetary and fiscal state of affairs. It, it, everything, everything, the reasons you own gold all center around that. They all come back to that eventually. You, you can have other reasons that you own gold, but it all comes back to that. Think about it. How much gold would you own if there had been no quantitative easing, no money printing, if there was no government debt, if there were no government deficits? We were always in a surplus every year. There were not only no negative rates, but bonds actually paid you something reasonable, that you, tangible, that you could actually see your bank account growing. What if right. there was no extra, you know, money printing, excessive credit? What if, what if they were actually handling the state of our financial affairs properly and and healthy and responsibly and responsibly? Yeah. Yes, and all of those things have been mishandled. They're completely out of whack, and so I don't believe they're in in a free lunch. I don't think you can do those things, and it's all going to be fairy tales and unicorns. I, the, the, you can't escape reality. You can, there is no free lunch, and so there's going to be some type of uh, ramification, some type of fallout. Uh, the, there's the systemic risk that we all face right now is very, very high. The level of risk in the system right now is very, very high, and we didn't even go over all the other reasons that. You know, it, it, you know that you might own gold, but the point is the ri systemic risk is is heightened <laughs> right now. And we can talk about Trump if you want, but but the bottom line is a lot of these things are baked in the cake. It's it's really not going to matter, you know, who the president is. Uh, right. All these things can't be resolved easily, quickly, and without some kind of fallout or pain or or what have you. The only question in my mind is. 
h- how does this process play out? Do we get one big overnight crisis where we wake up the next morning and you know the world's on fire in some way, or mm-hmm. it, it, is it drawn out and, and lasts over a period of years? And I, I realize when I ask myself that question that I I think the answer is, and it's just my opinion, but I think the answer is we're probably going to see a series of crises. There's probably going to be one, and then another, and then another, and then another. Uh, you think about the think back to 2008. So we, you know, a lot of people own stocks, and we watched in horror as the stock market fell. But remember the year before, what happened to the housing market? So we had a housing crisis one year, and a year or so later, you had a stock market crisis. And I think we're going to have a repeat of something like that. It may not be those two things. Uh, it probably will, but but who knows? My point is, it's probably going to be one crisis. And then things might look better or stabilize for a while, and then it'll be something else because we have so many things going on, all of which center around how our central bankers and our politicians have mishandled our our money and our finances. In addition to uh, major crises or series of serial crises, you've got the backdrop of this continual drawdown of the value of just about anything that you can put your hands on, uh, if it's certainly anything related to the money supply or any savings or investments or insurance or anything, you've got people keep talking about you know, in, you know, upcoming uh, bankruptcy of Social Security or of different pension plans or different things. All these these kind of crisis moments that will come, but in, along the way, every day it's a continual. Um, stealth taxes one way or another uh, through, you know, the AMT being not indexed for inflation, so more and more people being pulled into alternative minimum tax. That's right. And on and on and on. Just just keep on going down the line. It's this death by a thousand cuts that's happening even in the absence of overt crises. So so that just bolsters your, that's the backdrop that, that gives you the foundation under which everything's sliding down regardless of when the crisis comes up. Yeah, that's a good point. There, there, it, it's been a seeping type of uh, inflation, yeah. and inflation is officially low, and yes. and it is. But <laughs> we went to, we, we buy uh, various Ziploc bags for different, we looked, uh, our favorite brand of, of these really sturdy two and a half gallon Ziploc bags, the box now holds 11, where it previously held 12. Exactly. That's an 8% inflation, even though right. the price didn't change. That's right. 8%. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've noticed that in many things. Yes, that's true. Uh, but but more to your original point is, is that even though inflation is low, it, it's really seeping into our economy more than people realize. Just since – remember, everybody was always worried about Y2K back in 2000. Since that, since that sure. time, okay, in 15 plus years, whatever, we we the value of our currency has been devalued by 28 percent, 28 percent, and inflation officially the CPI has been really low. But when you add in the cumulative effect of this going on and on and on, it's 28 percent. Uh, most people find that hard to believe, but you can only buy – what is that? Uh, uh, 72% of what yeah. you could buy back in 2000 with the same dollar today, and that's with low inflation. So if we get real inflation, there's going to be a serious wake-up call. We have not had you know, significant or high or let alone runaway inflation with uh, this generation. They're completely unprepared for it. In giving a, a pictorial representation of how far out of whack, as you say, things have been taken by uh, government interventions, you have a graphic chart, a bar chart, uh, near the beginning of your article where you're contrasting the value of all the gold ever mined yes. versus some of the recent recent government interventions. If you could just tell us the, sort of what the nutshell uh, takeaway is. Boy, that, that really is a picture that's worth a thousand words. If you could share that with them or something, because what I did was I took all the, the government manipulations and interventions that I'm concerned about that, that comprise my core reason for owning gold and why I'm not worried about where it's going. Uh, and I put them into a graph and I thought, well, let's compare it to gold. What, you know? And I, I couldn't get gold to show up on any graph, on any chart at all. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have to show not just gold supply. I'm going to show all the gold that's ever been mined in mankind, in the history of mankind. 
So I got a figure. I multiplied it by $1,300 gold, and now the 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 bar for gold actually did show up on the chart. <laughs> Just. Just barely. But you've got – at 1300 gold, roughly, and don't quote me any of these figures, but it's roughly about five and a half trillion dollars of gold if you add up all the gold that's ever been mined in the history of mankind that we know about and that is still available above ground. The bailouts in the US were just under 12 trillion, so more than twice all the gold ever mined. Uh, negative interest rates are, you know, the estimates vary, but let's say it's 20 trillion. Well, that's four times more than all the gold that's ever been mined. Total worldwide bailouts are over 16 trillion. The U.S. debt is what is it? Tw is it 20 now? Did it reach 20 trillion? So, Almost. Yeah. So it, that's you know four times as much. And then I got I found out what the global debt picture is for all the developed nations, and it's 152 trillion dollars. Again, all the gold ever mined was five and a half trillion. So all of these government interventions and mismanagements and manipulations, all this stuff they've done, most of which has occurred since 2008, dwarfs the entire supply of gold that's ever been mined in the history of mankind. It, it's really quite astounding, and it's not even a fair comparison because I'm comparing what they've done over the last you know eight ten years. Versus all the gold that's been dug up for centuries uh, that's still available. And it's also not fair because all the gold ever mined really isn't available for you and me to buy. Only you know roughly 45% of that figure is available in investable form, meaning coins and bars or jewelry in India, something like that. So uh, it, it, you know that bar should even be half that. Uh, size on the chart. Well, now it would it'd really barely be available. So it, it's really amazing when you go through all these, each factor, which is basically what my article is devoted to. Uh, it, it, it's really quite astounding and, it, and it's kind of scary when you look at all of these government interventions and manipulations and compare them to gold. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it paints a pretty ugly picture and a pretty stark picture. And any reasonable person would be forced to conclude, okay, how does this get resolved? That, that's, that's the real question. You know, what happens here? And, and in part of answering that question, you, you led next in your article to talk about what happens to gold when a crisis hits. And you know, having kind of discussed the multitude of risks that are inherent in our current situation because of the mismanagement of our uh, economic uh, world by the by the politicians and governments over the past decades. Uh, so when you look at what happens, uh, does your net worth rise or fall in the next crisis? Uh, what do you what do you look at in that question? Uh, that that's really um, a, a good question because when I did this article, it, it was really sobering and angering to me to realize that my personal net worth has been directly impacted by what central bankers and politicians have done. That's right. My net worth, they, what they did lowered my net worth. It stole from you. I mean, that's so in, innate and instinctive. We recognize that viscerally as human persons is that the, the uh, value that we create through the sweat of our brow and the work of our hands is ours. It belongs to us by virtue of our work that we put into it. And for someone to take an action that takes that away from us is is stealing. I mean, it's 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 wrong, and it, it runs counter. It, it grates against our very fiber of of understanding our the true natural rights of 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 workers to you know own the the result of what they what they build with their own hands. And that's. Sorry, I just couldn't help jumping in on that one because it's just it, it's it's so it's so important to reality uh, that that anyone who takes from you what what you uh, worked for is stealing. So go ahead. Yeah, I I, I agree, and, and that's a core reason why I own gold is because I don't think there's a free lunch. All these things are going to have some type of ramification or fallout. There's going to be another crisis, probably a series of crises, and uh, gold will benefit from that. That's what, that's what gold is. It's a crisis hedge. It's an inflation hedge, uh, and I think that uh, there's actually two parts to that. One is 
that there's going to be a crisis. I think it's baked into cake. Uh, e- e- even if you know Trump gets his wish list all fully completed, in a minimum, there's going to be inflation. We can talk about that if you want. But these things are baked into cake. The cake is in the oven. Those things are there. You can't just wish them away with a magic wand. Okay. So there's that reason that I own gold. But the other thing is it's how government will respond to those crises that make me think that's going to double the price of gold after the crisis hits. So you know, gold will respond to the crisis. The price will. Uh, our standard of living uh, will remain the same and will probably go up. But it's when the government intervenes yet again in the next crisis and tries to head it off and tries to solve it and you know that sort of thing. Their, their responses are always inflationary, and their responses uh, – look in 2008 how they respond to that crisis, and if we get another similar type of series of crisis like that, and, and I just don't see how it's avoidable at this point, gold would not only respond to that crisis, but it will be the, the quote-unquote solutions that the government offers to those crises that will – be inflationary in nature in, in some capacity, and that will push up the gold price even further. And, and it's at that point it will be absolutely critical that you own gold and silver um, because when there's a when there's a gold rush, uh, there's nothing quite like it. And you know we you know there could be other ramifications. Gold could be hard to get then. Premiums could really really skyrocket. Uh, you may have to go on a waiting list to get it. Um, you know, it may only be available to institutional investors. Uh, who knows? There's any any number of ways this could play out. Uh, the bottom line for me is I want to be prepared for that now. So I'm I'm continuing to buy gold now. I bought another uh, gold buffalo here just a couple weeks ago. So I, I I'm preparing for it because I I just don't see that there's going to be a way out. I I know how the government's going to respond. They've done this. They've responded with inflationary policies for literally centuries, for literally millennia. Uh, I know how they're going to respond, and I know what that's going to do to the price of gold. And so if I – just one last comment on this. I, I really think most people think gold as a defensive uh, tool. Uh, it, it usually is. Uh, it will be defensive coming up, but I, I really think the other part of this is it's going to be an offensive investment for us. In other words, you're going to make a lot of money. You're not just going to protect your standard of living. You're at, it's actually going to grow. I, I think there will be some kind of wealth transfer, and the greater the crisis, the more likely that is to come true. And so I do view gold and silver as an investment in the sense that I, I'm going to profit from it. I'm going to make money, not just maintain my standard of living and be defensive. I'm actually going to make money through this uh, wealth transfer process. Now, you mentioned a few minutes ago about uh, now that Trump has been uh, elected president of the United States, uh, we've been hearing so much about how he's from. He's an outsider. He's not a career politician. He barely could get along well enough with the Republican Party leadership that they would even keep him on and get him you know, endorsed and in there. Um, that he basically breaks every mold, tears up the script, and does it his own way. So if all that's true, then why wouldn't why wouldn't our outlook be that that things are going to be handled differently going ahead in the next crisis? What makes you still have confidence that there's going to be inflation ahead? Uh, that's a good question. Well, look at what he wants to do. Let's take him at his word. Uh, like him, hate him, whatever. It doesn't matter. He's the president, and we got to deal with it. So. Uh, if he gets his, the you know, you can go on his website and you can look at what I'm going to do in the first hundred days, you know, type of thing. So he wants to lower taxes. He wants to uh, uh, build out infrastructure. So right away, those two things. We're talking trillions of dollars just in those two things. Trillions. Okay. So debt is going to have to go up higher. So right there, you've already got higher inflation. You have other countries as well, Europe, Japan, they're all focusing on infrastructure. Uh, interest rates are probably going to have to go up. Uh, the US dollar is probably going to weaken. Volatility is going to go up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and not only will rates go up, 
But real rates are, are going to, which is the real driver of gold, by the way. It's you know uh, the the nominal rate minus inflation, uh, that kind of thing. You know, lower real rates are, are going to drive gold. Um, really, you add all that up, and you couldn't design a better setup for gold than that. A, be, a, a better situation for gold than that kind of scenario. Uh, the bottom line for me is that government spending is going to increase under Trump. We, we, he's going to try. He's going to do whatever he can. And more government spending means a lower devalued dollar, and at some point there has to be a reckoning with all these policies that they've had and all the debt that's been run up. And that's why I believe there's going to be at some point real inflation, not not the kind of inflation we have now, but serious inflation that makes headlines. And of course, gold is you know the number one asset to protect against inflation. All this talk of inflation leads me back to a interesting statement that Mike Maloney makes in his uh, book about uh, gold and silver investing, and he talks about before we get to uh, large-scale inflation, he sees a deflationary period preceding that. First of all, if you can help us understand why that's uh, Mike's prediction. And secondly, uh, if gold is a hedge against inflation, then is it actually an, uh, you know, the opposite of an asset when you're, when you're looking at a deflationary period? Uh, that's, a good, that's a fair question. Uh, but think of gold as not just an inflation hedge or maybe a deflation hedge, but a crisis hedge. It's really it's, – it's all about crisis. It, 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 it's about chaos. Uh, so let's say we do get deflation. He thinks we're going to get deflation first. Uh, the money supply has been continuing to drop and drop and drop, and he thinks uh, another recession is – either here or very soon coming, uh, irregardless of the fact that Trump has been elected. Um, you know, deflation's all about <clears throat> – uh, oh, I'm sorry, not money – did I say money supply? It's about the money multiplier. So you can go on the Fed's website and look at that. It's very, very low, and it continues to fall. Uh, he thinks the inflation will result uh, from government spending and, and really – pushing that money multiplier up a lot higher, uh, making people feel a lot better about the economy. So the economy may actually, under Trump, appear to get better first. And maybe it will. We can all hope for that. But when the economy gets better, you're going to have the number one driver of inflation set in. And the number one driver that all these analysts look at is wages. So when wages start to go up again, when you see that, that's really going to be a a clue that, okay, inflation really is – real inflation, high inflation is around the corner once wages start to go up again. So uh, did I answer your question? I'm not sure if I – I think so. And, um, but specifically, holding holding gold in a, in a deflationary period, does your gold actually oh, yeah. lose value temporarily? Yeah, it could. If we have a crisis like 2008, if, if it's quick and sudden and shocking, a shock to the system type of thing, yeah, gold gold is a liquid asset. And a lot of reason it was sold in 2008 was for its liquidity purposes. A lot of uh, people weren't necessarily thinking they didn't need gold, but they had to sell it to cover other positions that were obviously losing a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, it could if it's an overnight shocking type of environment, you know, where the S and P fell, what was it, forty fifty percent in one month, you know, back in two thousand eight. Um, but a real deflation where you know the the money supply is contracting. Um, that's usually not something that is just a you know a one day or one week event. Uh, that kind of crisis can really push people. You know, a real true deflation lasts can last for months or even years, and and that kind of event can push people into gold. And, and the best example, of course, is the Great Depression. And a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, you know, the, the gold price was fixed during the Great Depression. It was, but what was the only form of gold? that investors could own back then? Well, it was gold stocks. And gold stocks went through the roof. They went up four and five hundred percent. And this was the producers, not even the juniors. The juniors were a lot of the better ones were ten baggers. This is during the Great Depression, while there's, you know, soup lines and falling unemployment, people are starving, you know, all of that's going on and Gold stocks are going up four and five hundred percent during that three to four year period. So the the only 
form of gold they could own during that time, during the worst deflation we've ever had, uh, was gold stocks, and they rose. So, you know, we nobody really has it all stood up and how this is going to play out. Nobody knows exactly how it's going to play out. It's probably going to be messy. There's probably going to be – it's going to be dynamic, meaning there's going to be several things going on at once. And so even if we get a deflation, there's going to be other issues going on as well. That environment, a crisis type of environment, I mean the number one safe haven people think of is gold. It won't be bonds and it won't be the US dollar. It, it may feel that way at first. It may look that way at first. But ultimately, it's going to be gold. And as we look forward to the very real and present uh, danger of one or many uh, crises in the in the years ahead, you're saying that it's the government's action in response to those crises that's really going to have the major uh, impact on uh, on gold. And it's also uh, by implication when you talk about gold as a, as a calibration of, of uh, confidence or a, a hedge against crisis. It's the um, sentiment of the people, the awakening of the people to the real risk that they're under that will be magnified and cause a flight to gold. So, so it'll, be a out, it'll be a disproportionate reaction to whatever was happening financially will, will be focused, or like, a, like a lens focuses a sunbeam, it'll be focused down into gold as everybody tries to rush to that, that uh, limited uh, safe harbor. I remember remember – yes. I remember going uh, – I was flying somewhere. I don't remember. And I was waiting in an airport and sitting at a bar and everybody – and I, I I am dead serious about it. Everybody around me was talking about – this is 2006 – was talking about real estate. Every single conversation at the bar was about real estate. It was the peak of the market, and I think that's what we're going to have in the market. And I, I think that's where we're headed. At some point, I think it's going to be inflation, but whatever the catalyst is, I think we're going to have a true gold rush. We're going to have a gold mania, just like we did in real estate, just like we've had in stocks before. We've even had it in gold before back in 1980. I think that's going to happen again, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm simply preparing for it, and I think part of the – Reason, yes, is the kind of crisis environment that we'll have, but part of it will be the government's response to that crisis. And so, you know, when something happens, if you're a deflationist, I, I don't disagree with you. I simply ask you to continue reading the book. It won't be the last chapter. What, what, how would the government respond if we really do get a true deflation? Their response is going to be highly inflationary. They'll do more money printing. They may not call it QE. They may not call it quantitative easing. They may call it something else. I mean, QE was a new term back in, you know, 2008. So right. they'll call it something else. Uh, but their re their basic response at its core level will be inflationary in nature. And my fear is that the crisis is bad enough that they overreact and push us into something really nasty. I, I mean, I seriously hope we don't get hyperinflation. But the risk of that isn't zero. I, I have to account for that possibility. The government is forcing me to prepare in some way for that possibility because the risk is not zero and because I know how they're going to react. Well, Jeff, you've uh, given us some Real interesting thoughts to think about as far as the the impact of government interventions in proportion to the amount of investable gold that's out there and the likely way that that plays out. Before we end tonight, is there are there any other thoughts that you'd like to leave uh, with our with our viewers? Um, I just I mean I work for a bullion dealer, so I don't want to give some cheap promotion or something. But before I even worked for a bullion dealer, I. I mean, I really believed in owning physical gold and silver, and it's not because I'm a gold bug. <clears throat> it's because it's the safest form to own. It's something that's private. It's it's confidential. It's a tangible asset you can hold in your hand and take with you anywhere. It's highly liquid. <clears throat> I mean, you can't get that kind of, you know, asset, <clears throat> you know, today in today's world. Everything's you know more transparent. It's all a lot of paper. You know, stocks, bonds, you know, even real estate, you know, that that's not liquid. It's comes with a lot of, you know, uh, costs and, and, and things. It, it's not easy to deal with. So uh, there, there's very few assets in today's modern world that give you the advantages that actually physical gold and silver do. And I 
I, I just believe in owning it. I, I don't own any paper, gold, or silver products at all. Um, and I, I own probably close to an equal amount, probably a little more gold than silver. But I own, you know, a, a, a fair amount of both. I am overweight gold and silver at this point in history. And I, you know, for me, I just continue to accumulate because I, I believe this is where I need to be with my finances right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, federal government. <laughs> well, Jeff Clark, Senior Precious Metals Analyst at GoldSilver.com. Thank you so much for joining us for this first time here on Reluctant Preppers. You're welcome, Duncan, and I'll be happy to come back again someday. 